telling stories in the age of sabermetrics and uh, moderated by Steve Madden. Steve's the GM of Sports on Earth. Um, Sports on Earth is a joint venture between USA Today Sports Media Group and MLB Advanced Media. Steve's a two-time National Magazine Award winner who most recently served as the Vice President of Digital Product Development for Rodale. And I will let Steve tell you a little bit more about the panel, the idea, and the panelists. Great. Thanks a lot. So, um, Sports on Earth is, uh, as was mentioned, is a joint venture between Major League Baseball Advanced Media and USA Today Sports Media Group. Uh, we're based in Chelsea Market at BAM's offices. We uh, went live at the end of August of 2012, so we've been in business for about 18 or 19 months, um, and we're at about 1.8 million monthly uniques. The, uh, the conceit of the site, I think when we launched, all of the comparisons uh, that were made uh, were directly with Grantland. They said, oh, you guys are, you guys are gonna compete with Grantland, right? Um, and I think that that was sort of an obvious comparison, but when I think about what we do every day, where the comparison that's most apt, I think, is comparing us to The National, the newspaper that Frank DeFord edited in the, the late 80s and the early 90s. Yeah, the, the late lamented national. Um, and we, we want to bring back the, the idea behind the national, which was to offer really smart uh, commentary and analysis, as well as just great feature writing um, on daily sports news. I think Grantland you know, does an amazing job, but it's not exactly um, quick reaction the way that sports on earth is. If something happens, you know, I, I can tell you that uh, that Sean Powell, uh, our NBA writer, had his weekend ruined by Phil Jackson um, going to work for the Knicks yesterday. So we want to jump on things pretty quickly and we want to offer those opinions quickly. Um, but you can't have a, a media entity now, um, one that's rooted in writing, uh, without obviously taking advantage of all the tools at your disposal. So to that end, we've started adding video. But right from the outset, um, we've uh, embraced metrics as a way to help us shape the narratives that we tell and a way to tell our stories. And the writers, frankly, who are most successful on the site uh, are ones who can embrace those. Now, we write for a really general audience and uh, it's not, uh, we can't assume an incredibly deep level of knowledge of all of the metrics or necessarily of all the topics we're taking, uh, talking about because we get a lot of our traffic from USA Today, which has a very broad general audience. And on the other hand, we get a lot of our, our traffic, more, more of our traffic from MLB.com. And the, for readers coming from MLB.com, obviously we can assume uh, a much deeper knowledge, if not always a greater appreciation of, uh, of sabermetrics. So what we wanna talk about a little bit today is how uh, you know, there's, I don't, I don't think it's worth having a discussion about like, you know, should we use them or not? Because that, that, uh, that's a moot point and that horse is, is definitely out of the barn. But what we want to talk about is the use of these uh, numbers in, in something. I've been, uh, I've been in working in journalism since uh, 19 and um, things have- What things was have, that? <laughs> sorry, things have changed considerably in that time. Um, my, my colleagues here are younger than I am, and uh, Emma, Emma said something to me today that, that made my jaw drop. She said, I grew up with sabermetrics, um, which made me realize not how young Emma is, but how long I've been at this. Um, but I think that that's really the, the type, Emma's the type of person we want to bring, uh, bring to the site and the type of reader we want to attract. So we'll talk a little bit about that. Just let me introduce um, the panelists quickly. Emma Spann is the senior editor for Sports on Earth. Um, she writes primarily about baseball when she writes for us, um, and she is uh, the author of 90% of the game is half mental and other tales from the edge of baseball fandom. Uh, Emma has worked at a variety of places before coming to Sports on Earth. Uh, her works appeared in uh, the New York Press, Slate, Newsday.com, and Baseball uh, Prospectus. She graduated from Yale, and what she didn't put in this but should have is that she was once on Jeopardy so she's comfortable in front of a crowd. Uh, 
to my immediate right uh, is Howard Magdal, who's a contributing writer for us. Um, and he's also a writer at large for Capital New York, which is a terrific website. Uh, he's written all over the place, including for the New York Times, New York Magazine, ESPN.com, Salon, um, and a bunch of other places that you uh, have probably heard of. And uh, the statistical outlier here in the group is Mike Tanier, uh, a staff writer for us. Uh, Mike covers the NFL. And uh, we wanted to bring him along because we think um, there's, a lot of, th th there's a lot of insight to be gained from the fact that baseball is so far ahead of the pack when it comes to embracing these analytics. Part of it is just the structure of the game, but um, it's just done, frankly, because of the work of groups like this, done a much better job of making these statistics make sense and making them available to people. And he can talk a little bit about the difference between baseball and football. Um, Mike was also uh, a high school math teacher for how long? <coughs> Years. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, Mike includes uh, among the students he taught two uh, NFL quarterbacks, including Joe Flacco. Mm -hmm. So um, it, the other quarterback was Ron Dane. <laughs> if anyone realized that he was a quarterback, his career would have lasted longer. <laughs> I think the Giants put him at running, about, running back because he was 260 pounds. But yeah. So. Um, Jay Jaffe, who is a writer for SportsIllustrated.com, um, has a terrific line that sort of uh, encapsulates uh, how we feel about this. We feel that we are the liberal arts wing of uh, the sabermetric movement. Um, we're all you know, sort of English majors. Um, and yet also, in true liberal arts fashion, have a keen appreciation for everything uh, that, that you can bring to bear to help tell a story. Um, and, and that's really what we do. We, we tell stories all day. Um, whether those stories are uh, opinions or analyses, um, they still have to have a beginning, a middle, an end, and, and draw a conclusion. That's what, uh, that's what stories do. And so when we do that, we have to be accurate, we have to be compelling, and increasingly, we have to be entertaining. Um, you cannot, gone are the days when you can just print something and hope someone reads it and have no idea whether they do or not. Uh, our analytics tell us how many people open the story, how many people look at it, how many people read it, how long they read it, how far down the page it goes. It's fairly brutal, and you have to check your ego at the door um, in, in order to, you have to have a really thick skin in order to be able to do, uh, to do this kind of work. Um, and so, you know, I, I think that the reason um, Sports on Earth exists is because so much of what's available on the internet is just designed purely to get clicks, um, to get people to look at it. So you're, you control, you can be provocative, deliberately provocative for no good reason. And we're trying to cut through that. We're, uh, when we're out on sales calls and we talk to people and they say, what's your elevator pitch for sports on earth? We say, smart is better than loud. It's better to be intelligent and play to the higher instincts uh, of people rather than their basest instincts, although base instincts get more clicks, I'm here to tell you. Um, but uh, with, with that sort of, uh, that, that preamble, uh, I wanted to get started by, uh, I think I'll, I'll, I'll throw it to Emma first. Um, who are you trying to reach when, when you sit down to, to write a piece for SOE? Who do you have in mind? Um, so our, our pieces generally have different audiences depending on where they get promoted. So, you know, our stories on USA Today is gonna have an audience that maybe knows a little bit less than one on MLB, and that one might have uh, less knowledge of sabermetrics than an audience that comes from social media or blog posts or Facebook, where it's a kind of a similar audience sharing it. Um, we want to make sure that while we convey all the knowledge that we have, that our writers also don't, you know, alienate the readers who aren't as up on it right off the bat. Um, you don't, but at the same time, you don't want to stop and you know re-explain what war is every time you publish an article. Um, one thing that's really helpful about writing online and not in the paper is that you can link. Um, so you can just say, you know, click here for an elaborate explanation of what ERA plus is, and you don't have to stop and re-explain and lose the knowledgeable crowd. Um, but our hope would be that people who aren't as into that would still be able to enjoy the stories and not, you know, run away screaming, um, thereby losing us an audience and a chance to, you know, teach people. And, you know, to that end, I, I think there's less of a balance than I think is commonly assumed um, in the sense that we're looking to tell a story 
And the basis for that story so much of the time uh, when I'm researching ahead of going to write a piece is based on the numbers. But then the story itself is still telling a story that someone's going to be interested in, you know, regardless of their statistical background. And it's just a question of it being, uh, like you were saying, a, a question of being part of what was truthful, what was accurate at the start of it. It's still a story that you need to tell uh, that, that flows from that truth. Mike, do you have a, someone, a, a reader in mind when you sit down to... I, I'm always looking for an invested reader. I'm always looking for an engaged. And I'm looking for a curious reader as well. I'm not necessarily looking for somebody who is incredibly interested in mathematics because you're not going to find that many. I mean, we have many people here like that. We don't have many people on the Internet like that. So if you're coming simply because you want to have the argument everyone else is having about LeBron or uh, about, uh, you know, Peyton Manning or somebody like that, not necessarily somebody that I want to reach or that I'm going to reach with that. But if these people are coming in and they're curious and they're invested and they're engaged, they're going to follow you mathematically a certain way, they're going to follow you analytically a certain way, and they're going to meet you halfway. And it's my job and it's our job, I think, to meet them back with the other halfway, to mix in all that analysis with what you said, a good narrative, a good beginning, middle, and end, and something compelling to them. So how do you do it? I mean, like, what, uh, you know, you sit down, you, to, you've got a story to tell, um, you know, where do you start? Do you start, do you start with uh, numbers and statistics, or do you start with uh, the human element, uh, or do you try to combine the two and form a single entity out of both? I think that's what you do. You do find that entity, and, and I think you said it earlier, Howard, so much it starts with the statistics mm -hmm. from some of the things we do, and you'll look and you'll see an unusual, an outlier, or something that's incredibly high, incredibly low, and the amazing thing is that it's not being talked about, and mm -hmm. what's being talked about is the player's toughness or their heart, or their grit. And what you're really seeing is, you know, on an 0-2 count, he's doing this, or that, that, this sort of thing. Once you get that, that has to be what, you, and you said it earlier, a departure point. And then you find those ele other elements based on that. But that's a great way to incorporate statistics and analysis, not as the be-all and end-all, but as the beginning of an exploration, a journey, so to speak, that you can take a reader with you on. And, and, and to that end also, when you can find numbers that separate from what the story that's being driven most other places can right. be. When you, you know, that's when you know you're going to be able to depart from what's already being written and be able to write something different uh, about, you know, especially when it's about a familiar subject uh, right. or, or a popular subject. That, that's arguably the best of all possible worlds because you can impart something new about something that people care about a great deal. In, in my little world, a good example is Tony Romo. Mm -hmm. And you can grab Tony Romo's fourth, down, uh, fourth quarter statistics and his third and long statistics and his come from behind statistics and throw them at people and say, you know what, Tony Romo is not a choke artist. And, and it's, it's actually true. He's not a, uh, not a choke artist. I mean, I guess if you define that, whatever. And you can write that, and it's an interesting story. And, you know, your response is several hundred people telling you you're a moron, which is kind of cool, but you've reached them one way or the other. And I know that there's many examples in baseball that are almost a similar uh, uh, trait there. It's, and, and on the basketball end, I had that recently with Steph Curry, where there was a oh. uh, panel convened uh, on TNT to talk about how he's not a superstar and uh, is not a superstar point guard specifically. And it turns out the numbers are very clear to indicate that he is uh, distributing the ball at an elite level, in fact, at the best level in the league if you go by assist percentage. And so it was, it, it was fun. As someone who grew up rooting against the Philadelphia 76ers, it was fun to prove Charles Barkley wrong in, in that specific way. <laughs> oh, Charles is never wrong. Well, and he's an, an analyst of the highest order, That's too. True. Yes. Emma, how about you? Where do you start with this? Yeah, I think you want to start with the numbers. One thing is that so we have a lot of pieces that are just analysis, but we also have a lot of reported pieces. Um, you know, Howard and I are down here for spring training this week also. Um, so one thing that's been really helpful for me is when you're trying to talk to a player and trying to get them to say something interesting, um, the more general and broad and open-ended your questions are, like the duller the response that you're going to get. If you say, you know, how's your season looking? They're going to say, oh, I'm going to work hard and go out there and you know, play hard every day, and it's completely useless. Um, so the more specific that you can get, and one of the ways you do that is by looking at the numbers and saying, oh, you know, I see that you've been throwing a cutter a lot more. Can you talk about you know, why that is or how that came about or what you're trying to do there? Um, those kind of specific number, you know, data-driven questions often get you better answers and a better you know, human story from the player in question, too. So one of the, uh, you know, of, since, since we launched, and you know, like I said, it's eight, 18 or 19 months in, in the, of the probably 
2,000 pieces of content were published. The best performing piece, the piece that's been most viewed, um, is a story that one of our writers, Aaron Gordon, did. Uh, and, it, and it is about, it, it ranks the NFL, uh, NFL TV announcers. Um, and usually a piece like that is just sort of a guy writing off the cuff and saying, um, you know, oh, Joe Buck and Troy Aikman, they're, they're, they're just terrible together. You know, I'm going to put them seventh or something like this. Well, Aaron actually made uh, statistical grids and, and rubrics to, to measure how accurate they were in terms of what the guy was saying, how it meshed with what was actually happening on the screen. And the disconnect is, is much more common than you would think. Um, <laughs> and I think it was a, I think, I think part of the, I mean, it's sort of, you know, internet gold to do a ranking of something. But I think what I like most about the piece is that uh, it was, it was a ranking, but it had a lot of stuff to back it up, you know, a lot of, a lot of data uh, to back it up. Can you guys think of, of pieces that you've worked on? Um, it doesn't have to be on, on SOE, just in the course of your career, that, um, that have succeeded because of a treatment like that? You think like it really took a, a good piece and took it over the top and made it a great piece? Well, I, I can speak to one that uh, wouldn't have existed without those numbers, and I wrote, wrote it for us, which was uh, about Adam Wainwright. And uh, I was heading out to St. Louis to do uh, a deep dive piece into the organization. And while I was there, uh, I wanted to see what else I could do. So the first thing I do when I'm headed to a city like that is check out the numbers, see what people are doing this year, see how that deviates from previous seasons, see if there's a reason why someone is up or down, relatively speaking. And I noticed that uh, Adam Wainwright was throwing uh, something like 31% four-seam fastballs, and he had never been doing that throughout his entire career. And I thought that was notable. This is a guy who had had a ton of success, and I was curious as to why. So it led, led me to his locker and ended up uh, with a, a deep dive piece into not only Wainwright reinventing himself as a pitcher and doing so for a specific reason, which was to improve his control, uh, but also just the work with uh, Derek Lilliquist, his pitching coach, and how successful it had been. And interestingly, he not only reinvented himself, started throwing these pitches, but he was walking uh, le less than one batter per start. I mean, it was just this amazing turnaround that totally came out of reinventing himself in this way. And never would have known to ask him about that if I hadn't seen those numbers. Uh, there are many examples of that in a smaller way, but that's sort of the biggest one where a piece came out of exclusively what I saw. So when you, uh, just to, to stay on this yeah. for a minute, when you went to him and said, hey, I've noticed mm -hmm. this, how did he react? He, first of all, he was more engaged as a result of it, um, you know, to what we were speaking about with the generic questions. Um, I try to lead with specifics to a player because I found that, you know, arguably in like the limited amount of time you have with the guy, let's say 10 or 15 minutes at his locker, he could tune you out pretty fast. And if you come in and he understands you're prepared and you know about his, uh, his career and his work and what he's doing, it makes a huge difference. And, you know, Wainwright's great anyway to talk to, but it was clear that he understood that uh, I was invested in what he had done. Mm -hmm. And so I think I not only found something there, but I think I got better answers from him and a deeper understanding of what he had done and why because I was able to come to him with that. Do you remember what he said? Was he surprised that you that you knew that? Yes, he was, he, he was surprised. He was surprised that someone had noticed, actually. Uh, and, and we sort of took it from there uh, as to the mechanics of how he did it. But he was all too happy to talk about it. I mean, the, you know, these guys are craftsmen, and they're working very hard at what they're doing every day. So to have someone who's noticing anything beyond seven innings, two earned runs into the, you know, into the process that they're involved with every day is something that gets them very excited. And mm -hmm. that's, you know, you, you can't do that without knowing the numbers. So it wasn't news to him that he had done it? No, it was not. It, 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 yes, it was encouraging. <laughs> Emma, how about you? Um, well, I'm working on something now that I don't know if it'll come out well or not, but hopefully. Um, one of our writers, uh, Chris Swick, pitched me a story about the White Sox pitchers and how under their coach, Don Cooper, um, They've had a lot of success at turning around guys who have been struggling and at keeping them healthy, and he wanted to you know, look through some numbers to, to back that up. And I said, well, I'm actually going to be out in Arizona, so why don't I go ask him about it? Um, so we're hopefully going to do a joint story. Um, Cooper talked a lot about, you know, the, you know he doesn't think that, the, that you know, keeping the pictures healthy is an accident at all. They have a, a plan for it. 
Um, he talks some of the pictures about what they work on with him and who he's turned around and how. Um, so hopefully, and then Chris is going to go back and look at what he said and see how much of that we can prove by going through the data. Um, some of it is, you know, you can't quantify how good his communication is, um, but you can see, okay, are his pitchers throwing more strikes because of this plan? Are they staying healthier? All that stuff, which I think is, you know, theoretically, and we'll see how it comes out, but uh, should be a good combination of, you know, analysis and reporting that would hopefully be the best of, of both worlds there. Mike? A whole lot of what I've done over the cool career has been about bringing the statistics in, and it's now sort of like almost organic to some of the things I do. Earlier in the career, you, you, though... You kind of almost came at it from the other way, that, that you were like much more about statistics, right? Because of where you started and then, and then the, the sort of the narrative part of it backed in, right? Exactly. Well, starting with Football Outsiders. And, and when, when I joined Football Outsiders in 2005, it was just when we were about to become part of the Prospectus family, which we were for several years. And Aaron Schatz kind of said, we need you to be the Football, football Outsiders light guy, which kind of dovetails with the, you know, the liberal arts mm -hmm. wing, because you can take these statistics and do mm -hmm. other things with it. Uh, moving on from that, where uh, you know, it was a, a chance for you could really talk about the numbers themselves, which is what we did a lot there. Uh, early on, you know, the statistics are the characters. Um, as we move past that, you know, I would go to whether it was a Fox editor or a New York Times editor, and like the question would be, you're going to bore and lose everyone with statistics. And the real answer is no, we're going to bore and lose everyone by saying the same things everyone's been saying since 1954 about these sports. You know, does this guy have his stuff? You know, is this guy, does this guy have heart? If we're going to keep telling the same story, the rookie quarterback has it. He has the special quality. If we're going to do that uh, ad nauseum, we're going to lose everyone because now everyone can read everyone else's articles. Everyone can Google search last year's articles. So we're going to, we're going to bore everyone with that, so we might as well take a chance doing this other thing. And, and increasingly, over the last few years, we've seen that there has been a receptive element to that, that people want to hear the other thing. And what you guys both said, the players want to hear something else. They want to hear other questions. They become more invested when they know we're talking about something more than the little kabuki theater of asking them how their day was, and they say, we're going to give you 110%, and we're in the best shape of our lives. Well, then. <laughs> do they still do that in baseball, best shape of his life? Do they still oh, yeah. do that? Oh, yeah. That's still a thing? So. Wow. Yeah. But, but how about that? I mean, do you, do you completely discount the other part of it? The, the chemi like chemistry, heart, um, things like that. I mean, it, are those, are those words might be anathema in a setting like this, but I, you know, like, do, do you completely? No, not, not at all. I think, um, you know, one thing that you have to be careful about is, you know, just because you can't measure something doesn't mean that it's not real. Um, and every player that you ask will say that the, you know, the mental approach to the game is important, that, that chemistry does matter to them, that the relationship they have with their teammates and their organization matters. And I think it would be, you know, I can't prove that, but it would be pretty arrogant to totally dismiss something that every athlete you ever talk to will tell you. Um, so I think you just want to be careful about relying too much on those stories, but I don't think that you want to just, you know, dismiss them either because there are real things there, even if, you know, you don't want to definitively say, you know, yes, the A's won because of their chemistry. Like, no, they won because they had good players. But I also think it's, I wouldn't dismiss that that was part of it. If they all say it, I think it's at least worth, you know, respecting that. Well, there's also a way in which those two come together, which is that let's say you have uh, an example would be a piece I'm working on about the Dodgers right now, and the Dodgers had a certain way of uh, of working with minor league players. Well, under old ownership, they had a finite amount of resources, they had a finite amount of coaches who were able to put things into in, into place. So, if you have more people who are able to go one on one and communicate then you're able to make sure that a plan across an organization is carried out. Well, so now you're saying, okay, well, communication is vital. That's not some nebulous idea. That's a very specific way of implementing something that may have a, and does have a statistical bent to it. But when you talk, when you introduce statistics into the conversation, you get more of that information out mm -hmm. of the players. What does the communication mean? What does it actually entail? Totally. So a, e even at the, in the most general sense, you get a more specific, more detailed approach, and mm -hmm. that benefits the story, and it benefits our understanding, because we bring that back to the table the next time, we, even when we're looking at the statistics. Right. And, you, and, and that's, that's an issue. It's, you'll hear a lot of people stop with communication. Oh, well, we have great communication with the pitching coach, or great communication. But, and you would ask that question, stat or otherwise, well, what are you talking about? 
answering. And then getting that answer and making sure that there's an empirical basis for what that answer involves, you know, means that you're going to get something not general like you were saying. Emma. Yeah, I mean, every, every pitching coach will tell you that communication is important. Like, that's not, you know, some big shocker. Right. But, like, the White Sox were talking about, okay, well, you know, Cooper will do X, Y, Z, you know, talk to me for this amount of time on these days, this kind of plan, like that level of, of detail, you know. So it's not just a cliche. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, but you were saying that the um, the Dodgers said that the sandwiches were yes, key, that, which I think you, that, there could be a stat for that. You could quantify the kind of sandwich that someone eats and then their performance. I feel like sandwiches it, above replacement. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> it, it fall, that falls under the FDA, I think, more uh, than baseball uh, reference. A, li a, li a little a little context is in order here. We uh, at, at dinner at dinner last night, the story came up about the the, the Dodgers have uh, made a change. Um, they're, they're no longer serving in the clubhouse peanut butter and jelly, or smucker sandwiches. Is, smucker is, sandwiches, smucker yeah. Sandwiches. Which is apparently not officially peanut butter and jelly. Apparently, like, they're just called smucker sandwiches, and they're, they're not <laughs> labeled when they were given to the players. And under old ownership, that that was what the players were fed in the minor leagues every single day without fail. And so that, you know, there's been a movement to... Like now you can get turkey burgers. And exactly. I was very excited right. about the turkey burgers. So yeah. do, do you guys have, uh, do you have a statistic, uh, one or two statistics that you find is most helpful in, in helping us achieve our goal? Uh, I don't have just one because it depends so much on, on the story, you know, and what the story's about. But I mean, there's a lot that I use just to get a glimpse. I mean, part of my job too is, is fact checking. So if, if a or, you know, if, if a player says, oh, the Blue Jays rotation was terrible last year, I wouldn't, you know, go and make sure that's actually the case. Um, which in this case, yes. But uh, <laughs> uh, I look, I mean, I use a lot of things. My first, like, go-to at a glance one is probably, like, ERA plus, OPS plus, just because regardless of the era or the league or anything else, it'll give you just, like, a good, like, big snapshot. But you obviously have to break it down to find out why the number is what it is if you want to, you know, get more out of it. But, yeah, just as, like, at a glance, like, okay, how was this guy last year? Okay. Probably not, you know, the best number, but I like that it works in like 1920 or, mm -hmm. you know, today. I like those two, um, and and UZR per 150 just to get uh, a, a larger sense uh, defensively. We've uh, talked about yeah. how you have to use like a bigger sample size. Exactly for it, that. Right, which is yeah. another reason, like like you said, why you have to drill down for exactly that reason. And, and then, but basketball, um, when when I write uh, on the NBA, uh, PER is a stat that I really enjoy, even though it's somewhat embattled. But as someone who uh, also enjoys Oliver Perez, I don't really mind embattled. And what I like about PER is just um, that it gives you a lot of sense, a, a lot of different things per 100 possessions, uh, rather than uh, looking at things like points per game and things like that. Football's a little trickier. Football yeah. is a little trickier. I, I like the granularity that we can get now with statistics. Um, for example, I might look through um, some of the Football Outsiders databases and find that J.J. Watt leads the, uh, leads the NFL in defeats, which is a sort of a micro stat that we have. And I recognize if I go to the marketplace talking about his defeats that – I have to spend four paragraphs, like you said, explaining it or, or link people around. So, but what can we do nowadays? And you can do it in baseball. You can get down pitch by pitch from about a dozen different sources and get this data at a granular level. Similar in football, though not quite as good, but Pro Football Reference offers a lot, and I have access to play-by-plays. And you can go back and take each of those defeats, and I can watch them all. Just like you can go back and watch a lot of things. And I can look at these plays and then use it as a story to describe it. Okay, on this play it was a sack. On this play it was third and two. And Trent Richardson tried to run off the middle to name somebody who can get stuffed easily. And Watt stuffed him. And go piece by piece, pick the most interesting ones, and turn it into a tale that can be visualized. And that's a great opportunity we have now that dovetails with the analytics that isn't used enough, I think, in the storytelling. Where it's like, we can actually go back and find all these things and really like enumerate them and, and illuminate them and, and show them to the reader. Mike, sorry, sorry go ahead, Howard. No, well, to that end, when you were talking about uh, Brian Mattis, uh, pitcher on the Baltimore Orioles, had a nine-pitch outing uh, in May in which he utilized four different pitches. And like you said, it's getting that source and getting that... Uh, that pitch data mm -hmm. that allowed me to be able to go to him and reconstruct what he was thinking through an entire nine pitch outing because I was able to go back and watch it after I saw that he utilized four different pitches. I just happened to see that uh, on uh, MLB.com game day 
the night before. And, hmm. and so you're right, there's, there's a way to illuminate stories in that specific way. Brooks Baseball, obviously, is another one. When, when we're talking about sort of catch-alls, um, that was where I was able to spot the Adam Wainwright thing. And, and, and when I'm looking at a pitcher, I'm able to see something specific that might be season long, then go back and look for it in particular starts rather than maybe see a start that is an outlier to what a guy's doing that year. Hmm. Mike, let's, uh, let's talk a little bit about football uh, compared to baseball. Um, first of all, do you feel, do you feel that the uh, where on the curve is both football and the re football readers on Sports on Earth in terms of understanding, embracing, and wanting um, statistics and analysis uh, in the pieces? Well, it's a little tricky with football. Uh, we're here at a Sabre conference where you have so many, not just high-tech stats, but uh, like decades of experience with basic counting stats. And in football, it's all the statistics that you could paint on the ceiling of a cave. Uh, that's pretty much what we have or what we had until a few years ago. I mean, to give you an idea, if I said, guys, I need to get Yogi Berra's past balls from 1956 or something, can somebody give it to me? You guys know you can hit your smartphones, you can hit a couple things, hit baseball reference, and you have this really obscure, tiny counting stat from 75 years ago available to you, and everybody does and knows where they can find it. I don't know how many passes Larry Fitzgerald or Des Bryant dropped last year. You would think something as basic and important as saying, well, this receiver drops passes. You would actually be able to find that statistic. Well, I, I actually can because I have access to certain things, but it's not an official statistic. It's not in any record. It's not on pro football reference or anything like that. That's how far back you are. And, and there's advantages and disadvantages to that. And one simple advantage is if I can get the stat, I can just sort of plate it, you know, like a, like a delicious, uh, you know, mozzarella, like here, I don't have to do anything to this. Um, but the flip side of that is from a statistical standpoint, you guys have so many resources and, you know, thanks to going back to Bill James and, and, and John Thorne and all those guys, you have now like a, a 30 year vantage point where someone can grow up with Sabre mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, Football Outsiders started at 2005. So while we do get a lot of interested re readers, I mean, there's a lot of plowing the field for the first time, reinventing the wheel and also trying to take an entire culture. I mean, I'm here, I'm seeing that there are real, there are people from MajorLeagueBaseball.com, there's actual major leaguers and coaches who come to this. If we tried to do a football version of this, um, we'd get, you know, it'd be like a Star Trek convention in 1974. That's about what, what, what we would get with this. So, uh, you know, this is almost like an inspiration to what we do. It's like it can get here in 15, 20 years. But people who understand statistics, it's hard in football. There are so many more, what you call it, discrete events. Mm -hmm happening at the same time where, you know, I know when a hitter hits a pitch, it's pretty much between the hitter and the batter, and there's, you know, other elements in play. When a running back gains 15 yards, there's five blockers, there's a defense, the defense has seven or eight guys who impacted the play out of 11, and there's so many other factors that it's, it's a long road to hoe. But, you know, you, you said that, you know, it's not an official statistic, but you know where to go to get it. It sounds mm. like you're buying moonshine. Like, where, <laughs> no. where, like, it, where, like where, where are you going? Like, yeah, the, no, that is, is exactly this, is it. This, is, is there, a, is there a, a thriving cottage industry for this yeah, now? Yeah, burn his sources. <laughs> It, and that's exactly it. It is like buying moonshine. I know a guy who knows a guy, or, or, or at least getting a, getting a bookie maybe might be the better football-related example. Football Outsiders has some of these things. Pro Football Focus, another company, has some of these things. Uh, and, and some of them are available on the website. Some come out in the publications, like Football Outsiders Almanac, which comes out in early July. Um, and, but sometimes you have, to, you have to have a password, or you have to have a credit card, or you have to know the guy who runs the site. Uh, ESPN Stats and, uh, and Analytics keeps track of a lot of these things and they give them out on a need to know and who has the secret password uh, basis. And, and that's not good, that's not ideal, that's not how this advances. This advances when there's a lot of, of free exchange. And, and again, we're talking about something as basic as like a drop pass or a missed tackle, something that everyone could see because it's being kept independently by several different sites. You know, when you talk about moonshine, everybody's got their own recipe. So the numbers will be off by one or two and there's no official record and you're stuck saying, well, what do we actually do with this? And there's unfortunately so, no good answer. So, they're so it sounds like football is behind a little, little bit. Uh, about behind, 75 uh, years. Behind the times. Yes. But, but tell us, like, what's going on? Is there, is there this thriving cottage industry of helping people catch up, a broader acceptance of, of statistics? Are the, are the teams embracing these? Yes, and that's one of the things. I think you could talk to basketball. There's a lot of open sharing of the information. Yes. 
Uh, in football, every team is keeping the information themselves, tabulating it in-house, and then pretending they don't do it. And then sometimes going to the public saying, uh, analytics, well, yeah, we kind of look at that, but this is all about heart and toughness. And that sort of negativity, and we know that that's in all sports still, but in football, it's almost like an embarrassing little thing, like, yes, we hired a data person. <laughs> But no, they don't have any decision-making power, don't worry. You know, that, that's kind of how, it, how it's dealt with there. There is a cottage industry. In terms of acceptance, it's, it's difficult to say. I mean, we can sit here and we can talk about war and something as basic as on-base percentage can, can move forward and into the, the, the vernacular, which is great. And in football, you know, for years trying to get a quarterback statistic that makes some kind of sense. And I know so many people, people I've worked with, they're... they're professional rivals, who've come up with these great ideas, and then ESPN created TQR, which contains a variable for clutch performance, which means that, you know, lo and behold, somebody that um, ESPN might want to promote, Tebow, uh, you know, suddenly has this high value in the stack because there's like, there's like secret sauce in it, and, and so it's, it's another one step forward, two steps back. People are talking about information, and it's not getting done ideally. And, and you, know, you spoke about basketball, and that's, that's a great comparison because I think basketball in the NBA is closer to baseball but behind baseball mm -hmm. and ahead of football as far as that goes. Uh, when uh, my, my family, uh, big Giants fans, I want them to learn something about the NFL. I end up sending them your, your work, and they Thank see, you. and they're just kind of blown away because they're not seeing that information a lot of other places. Uh, the NBA uh, this year uh, introduced a, a site, nba.com slash stats, which allows uh, me to isolate many more uh, events and specifics as it relates to players, and it's a huge advantage. But there are teams, you know, Houston Rockets uh, are commonly cited as uh, the forefront of this, but even uh, the New York Knicks, who I, you may have heard are uh, not well run, uh, are looking into um, some statistical analysis at, in conjunction with what Phil Jackson will potentially bring. And already there's excitement that perhaps the Knicks will um, briefly improve before James Dolan wrecks it all again. Hmm. So Howard and Emma, you, you said that uh, having, having this, this data in your back pocket when you go to talk to a player can, can break the ice. Um, is it, is that, is it, uh, is that true in other sports? Is it, uh, are these as broadly accepted in other sports? I can, I can speak to a, a lot of the basketball work that I do, and uh, yes, very much so. That being able to talk to, uh, for instance, Isaiah Thomas of the Sacramento Kings a few, uh, few weeks ago, and seeing the improvements that he had made in a number of areas, uh, mid-range jump shot, for instance, and uh, you know how he was able to get to the basket led to a discussion, a very specific one, about what he had done and why. Mm -hmm. And uh, w wouldn't have been possible without knowing how Thomas had improved. Kemba Walker's another uh, example of that earlier this year. But yeah, the, the basketball players, you know, these, these are guys, again, you know, you go back to the, the human element of it. These are guys who are spending months, in, in Thomas's case, it was sh until 500 makes from 10 to 16 feet out, you know, working on that every day. And then, uh, you know, when he starts the regular season, people want to ask about, you know, whether he scored 21 points or he scored nine points. Well, you talk to him about that and you get a window into how someone becomes a top five level point guard when he's five foot nine and was the 60th pick in the draft a couple of years ago. And that was the key to getting into it. Right. Let's see, there's a lot of variety within baseball, too. Like I, um, this week, I, I talked to Mike Trout for a few minutes, who said that he only, the only stat that he looks at is runs scored, his runs scored. And that's obviously working fine for him, so like, you know, no, no complaints. But um, like he had Googled war to find out what it stood for, but he, didn't, he hadn't gone any farther than that. And then I talked to Zach Rinke, and he had, he had very specific thoughts about why he didn't really use FIP and XFIP anymore, and why he thought that uh, baseball needed to track the velocity of the ball off the bat and like that should be a stat that was more easily available. And like it just depends on, even within baseball, there are a lot of players who don't, you know, who don't really find that stuff helpful. Mm -hmm. And then other guys who are, you know, all over it. And there's a guy like Ross Ollendorf, who I did a story on last year, who actually circled back to me to have further discussion. He, he, we had talked about his stats. He had gone out to, uh, uh, to warm up a little bit and came back because he had some specifics that he wanted to talk to. Had a teammate, uh, Danny Heren, who was, uh, 
concerned that his pitches from 2006 had been improperly cataloged by Brooks Baseball, and that ended up being uh, a series of discussion. But it, it was more than just like fun and interesting. It was a window into how Ollendorf was thinking about pitching, and, and that I, I think allowed me to uh, approach the piece in a very different way. But you're right, there are guys who will dismiss these things for one reason or another, and, uh, but there, there's no downside to it. You know, that guy wasn't going to talk to you about something specific anyway. Well, even then you can, you know, sort of, you can translate it a bit into, right. you know, you're, yeah, throwing more strikes or whatever, you know, into different terms that still, that still apply. Absolutely. All right. So I want to take some questions, but before we do that, uh, I have a quick question for each one of you. Uh, what's your favorite sports stat? Or no, what's your favorite stat period? Hmm. Doesn't have to be, doesn't have to be sports. Sandwiches above replacement. Yeah. Absolutely. 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 Um, I, I don't know that I have one. I mean, I, you know, war has certainly been like the focal point of a lot of the conversations in recent years. I don't, you know, I don't, it's not the only stat that, that matters, but it's, it's a useful measure of, you know, what someone's thinking is on, it kind of stands in for, you know, someone's viewpoint on, on a lot of this stuff. So I find it interesting in that, in that regard. Lou Boudreau's 1948 season, just across the board. Just such a, such a cool thing for him to do. 18 home runs, nine walks, and he's the manager of the last Cleveland Indians team to win a World Series. So that's, that's my vote. That's a good step. Mine is plus and minus from hockey. Did you, you know, what happened when you were on the ice? Did you guys score or were you scored against? I, I tend to view each day that I work at Sports on Earth, <laughs> plus or minus, how did I do today? Do, do, I, do we get graded like that? Yeah, so if Will Leach say. blows something up, do I get a plus for that if I'm on there too, <laughs> writing something about Tony Romo? If you, if you retweeted it, yeah. yeah. Ah, you'll get, you'll get credit for it. Listen so. to him putting a dig in there. Public so let's, shaming. Uh, let's take some questions. Do you guys uh, have any, any questions for us that you'd like to ask? We were so thorough in our, in our discussion. Yes, sir. Oh, yeah. they got a dude. We, we were having just a prelude. We were having some fun with paper statistic, and we talked about Will Chamberlain. Mm. And we didn't know which of the stats, the hundred points or the other one. Well, uh, <laughs> <laughs> right. But but anyway, I, my background is the academic side of marketing, and I, I'm just curious. It's a new venture you have going. Uh, how do you do your marketing? How do you find outlets? How do you get compensated? How do we get compensated? I can't. I can't really. <laughs> can't really go into that, sir, in public. Um, <clears throat> uh, it's a. It's a great question. Um, the. You know, marketing on the internet is. Uh, there are two ways to go about it. You can buy it. You can buy your traffic, and you can buy your exposure, um, or you can take advantage of networks um, and the. What, that, that's what we do. We, uh, we have in the past, uh, we've experimented with buying traffic. Um, and at this point in, in our life cycle and the size of the site, it's not really uh, economically viable and certainly not sustainable to go out and buy traffic. But because we're owned by MLB, which has you know, a massive platform and is really good at promoting us, if you look at the front page of MLB.com each day, there are two spots where you can always see it. In the off season, the place where the scoreboard is in the upper left, that's always a, a roster for sports on earth. Scoreboard, the season's back in, uh, in play, so that's gone. But there are always at least two sports on earth stories promoted from there. We get um, promotion in the daily MLB newsletter. There's always a link to at least one SOE story. Uh, and we have a, a weekly newsletter that we mail as well. Then um, USA Today has a, an extensive network um, for the, uh, you know, there's, there's the, the paper itself, USA Today. Um, you can't click on anything in the paper, but that's sort of a brand building exercise to have our content in there uh, and in the other Gannett newspapers. But the websites, usatoday.com, their app in particular, they get much more traffic through their app now than they do uh, to the desktop version uh, and to the, the newspapers. And there's, their, their affiliate network is you know, thousands of sports websites. And you know, if we have a story about SEC football that's, um, that's particularly hot, a lot of those sites will link to us. Um, just being, you know, being good corporate citizens will link to us. 
Um, we've built traffic that way. But what's really worked for us, and we sort of, we, we, we thought this going in and we're actually uh, happily proved correct about it, is Twitter is a massive source of traffic for us. Because when you launch a site and you say it's dedicated to great <coughs> writing, um, we're at, at the point where uh, people who make a living writing really want sites like this to work. And so they're very good about sharing um, stories that they like from us. So we get, on any given day, Twitter's our, th our, our third best source of traffic. And there have been days when it's been our, our best source. Uh, Facebook is also pretty good. Um, but uh, direct load, which is just people who know the site and like it and come and type it in, probably more than anything right now is our, that's like on any given day, that's our best source of traffic. Yep. As someone writing for an audience but aspiring to do, like using it as a footstool for something else, uh, would you recommend being able to write on a variety of topics um, or try and write something that is consistent in order to build an audience? That's a good question. I mean, both can work, certainly. If you find a niche and you can own that niche. Like, we were just talking about um, uh, Paul Lucas, who does the, the uniform like blog at, at, at ESPN, which is like, you know, it would not have occurred to me to like make that a career, but it's really worked for him, and he's like the go-to guy for uniform writing. Um, I think that, that can definitely work at the same time. The more things that you can write about and the more ways you can write them, the more options you have. I mean, like, if you can write about any sport, then you can get you get hired by a basketball site, by a, by a baseball site, by a football site, and if you can, you know, do reporting as well as analysis, that's another thing that you have to offer. So, I mean, I guess I would say that you know, the more the better. But some, it really works for some people to just find find one thing and totally own that thing. Yeah, I think you want to drill down on the thing that you love, love the best and drill down to the point that when the time comes and you're asked for it, you've got a level of expertise, walking around yeah. knowledge, all that, and then at the same time keep some other balls in play as well, where there's other things you know, things that, that, you know, your second, third, fourth best interest, things that you can get to quickly. Make sure that you're ready to roll on those as well and kind of have like sort of a T formation there that, you, that you're ready to roll with. Because I think if you try to be too general, then you, you're another person who's just a generalist and you're not going to, when the time comes and they need somebody special, it, it might not be you, you know? I, I would echo both of those things, but I would also say that one thing that's very helpful um, or at least I've found to be very helpful is to target specific places where you want to write and figure out what it is you need to be particularly good at to write for those sites right. and uh, you know to make sure that uh, what you're doing can ultimately uh, lead to writing for that site you know whether that's reading the site at length or um, just simply a site that you already know about trying to see whether something new that you can add to it uh, a lot of times it's that even more so than uh, simply reinforcing what the site already has because they're just going to go with the people they already have to do that. I would say uh, that if I were going to err on one side, it would uh, be to err on the side of specificity um, because, you know, if you're going to write um, or whatever you're going to do, um, you're going to think about this all day long. So if this is what you're going to think about all day and if this is going to be what you wake up in the middle of the night worried about, it might as well be something that you care about. So, you know, the, if you get offered a job writing about non-ferrous metals, you might want to stop and think <laughs> before, you, before you actually take the leap. But if you get offered a job, you know, if you have, happen to have this goofy passion about baseball or about uniforms, about, you know, sports teams' uniforms, and you can turn that into a career, well, that's awesome. Like, what could be better? Really thought noiron.com was going to take off. It's very disappointing. <laughs> yes. Uh, earlier this week, uh, we had a panel that uh, dealt with which numbers athletes love and which numbers athletes hate. Manny Acta said that <clears throat> most, in, in his experience, a number of guys didn't like war. And the reason they didn't like war was it could be expressed as a minus number. Hmm. Now, my question is, have any of you uh, in your dealings with athletes or anyone else in sports started off using a uh, statistic and then somewhere along the line said, ooh, I think I made a mistake here. Um, go ahead. Uh, Football Outsiders has a couple stats. One is DVOA, uh, and it goes, it's above and below average, which means once you go below average, you're in the negatives, 
which means if you're like the 16th best or 17th best, I guess, you're in the negatives now. And there were a couple problems with it. I think one is the resistance you say, where somebody could be sort of in the range of below average, semi-mediocre, and you're giving them a negative score. That doesn't look right. And the other part of that is, uh, you know, it's, negative, it's a negative decimal percentage. That's not, that's not very good for anybody along the way. It becomes very uh, cumbersome. Uh, so while that's still on the site, there's also DER that expresses things in terms of yar, yards. And we work more to establish a replacement level. I know in base Ball, there's been re replacement level for a long time. Replacement level for quarterbacks and running backs and other things. So that now, if we're giving you a negative, it's because you've gone below the, the absolute bottom rung there and, and it becomes a little easier to deal with mentally and a little more acceptable. Yeah, I would say when, when talking to an athlete, I, I would never start out by saying, oh, I see your war is terrible. Like you got a negative <laughs> whatever there. Um, that's when you would drill down and see, okay, you know, are you working on your, you know, are you working on seeing pitches better? Are you working on walking more? Are you working on hitting the inside pitch better? Whatever the thing is that they've been struggling with, you would, you know, kind of, you would, a lot of it is just like presenting things so you don't offend people like right off the bat. Because I mean, I'd be pretty pissed if someone came to me and was like, wow, your writing's terrible. Like, let's talk about that. You know, like <laughs> when you're, and when you're editing, you don't, you don't tell someone, oh, you know, the story is awful. You would say, I think you need to work on your structure more and maybe, you know, do this or that. So like, I think we break it down to manageable chunks, but um, I used to uh, probably use defensive stats more and I'm more careful with them now because I just feel like, um, not that they're not still useful, but um, they often disagree, they jump around, and you, you have to, I feel like you want to look at a long, like a long chunk of time for those, for, for me to feel comfortable with them. Um, so I would never look at like, you know, one season anymore and think, oh, he had a, you know, he had a bad season, you know, defensively or a good season. That's something I've backed off of a little more because I think it's I'm not as sure of it. Well, and, and the other thing is that the stat is almost the messenger in that situation. Like, if a guy had a horrible 2012 season, he's not going to want to talk about the 2012 season, right. almost no matter how you approach it, whether you tell him, what, you know, what his war was that year, or you're just talking specifically about it. So you have to approach it very gingerly. So, realistically, when, when I talk to an athlete, you have to bring these things up when an athlete has had ups and downs, and, and otherwise you're doing a disservice, but to talk as uh, non-specifically as possible as those numbers go and talk about like, specific things that uh, he might have been struggling with instead. Great. Oh, over there. Can you talk about some of the instances in your writing career where you've had to pick between different methods of data visualization and what hmm. drove that ultimate decision? Uh, I'm I, about yeah, that. I, 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 I mean, ultimately, just about every place I've gone has had different standards for what stats I can use, what stats I can't use, what I'm going to explain, what I'm not going to explain, uh, and, and trying to figure that out has been really just on an editor-by-editor -editor basis. Uh, one of the refreshing things with Sports on Earth is there's a ton of freedom and there's a lot of conversation about how to constantly get better at that. Uh, but realistically, uh, a lot of other places, it is constantly an editor's choice and trying to figure that out uh, from editor to editor uh, is, uh, is a balance I feel like any, any freelancer struggles with. One thing I've noticed, uh, I don't tend to do a lot of like actual visualization as far as like charts or graphs myself, but some of our writers do. And even just like, even if it's just very basic information, like throwing a chart in there is almost always good because people are like, oh, cool chart. Um, so I would say if you have the chance to do that, it's a good thing to do to add, you know, any kind of, you know, there's free stuff online where you can just plug in the numbers and it'll make you a nice chart and like it's usually worth doing. Your fandom postseason flow chart comes to mind as something that was <laughs> yes. particularly useful. Very stat heavy. Yeah, yeah. I don't know how <laughs> you <laughs> properly explain that uh, other than with a chart. Well, as, as our site has matured, it's, it's, we've, we now have sort of now who, we know who we are and we know what people expect from us. That gives us greater license to move into other forms of media telling stories in different ways. Um, you know, the central conceit of the site is great writing. Um, so it's always going to be writing. There have been times when we think like, we don't need 750, 800 words on this when we can tell this story uh, in a chart or a graph uh, or, uh, or an illustration or even a short video. So um, as the site matures, I think we get, we get greater flexibility uh, and greater options in how we do that. We, we've recently added uh, a documentary series to the site um, and I think that that really helps us expand it as you know, tell the story, match the, the, the story to the proper medium to tell it. So 
Yes, go ahead. Hi. So uh, earlier, Steve, you'd mentioned um, you want to keep the bandwidth to be able to respond to immediate news. There's a monitoring Twitter, and meanwhile, everybody is also working on future projects. So um, can you talk a little bit more like tips or tricks on how to ch juggle all that, ju juggle future articles while also maintaining what's going on the second or last second? You never want to sleep because sleeping <laughs> yeah. sometimes yeah. restricts your ability to respond quickly uh, to a Tim Tebow signing that you have to simply drop your children and, and, and jump on. Uh, you know, there has to be a kind of flexibility in place. And one thing is I try to have a couple long-term projects going all the time that are there and they're running in the background and, and just recognize that, you know, if today is a good day, then that project will get done and go in. And if today is a Tebow day or a whatever day, an A-Rod day, whatever you might have, then this is not going in and you have to be recognized of that. And, and the other thing is that to, to, you know, if you have the ability to specialize, you have one or two sports, to make sure you have all the information ready to go in your mind so that you aren't blindsided with the, uh, say, who is Aaron Hernandez? I've never heard of this person. You're not at, at that particular level. Um, that doesn't always work because I don't know every defensive end at the University of Missouri, for example, and, and know what they're up to on a day-to-day -day basis. But it still gives you a chance that when the time comes, it's not a 22-hour block of work. It's a more manageable 17-and-a-half-hour yeah. block of work. Um, yes. We always try to have, like, kind of, our editor-in-chief talks about two tracks. There's some stories that are kind of bigger, more evergreen that you know, you can plan in advance that so you can get ready and then have people kind of ready to go when, when news does break. And we have a small staff, so like we can't cover absolutely everything, but, um, but especially in baseball, you know, because we have that MLB.com connection, we try to, if there's any big signing or trade or, or injury, we try to have rotation of people ready to go. But it is, yeah, it's a lot to juggle, but you try to plan half of it ahead and then react to half of it, I guess. Well, one of the inspiring things is that uh, it's by my nature that I'll sort of wake up at two o'clock in the morning and realize like there's a new angle uh, of something to be written about Oliver Perez uh, and I'll reach out to Emma um, and she will write me back at two in the morning, yeah. which is, you know, Emma's there and, 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 and Larry Burke, who we also worked with, and Steve will, will respond to me. Um, you know, so my craziness is actually encouraged in this case, which is um, not something mm -hmm. that I'm, that right, I'm always we're, used to. We're, take, we're, we're trying to not do that forever. To, but <laughs> to answer your question, we take advantage of people's neuroses. Right. Right. Um, but there, there, is, there is an expectation um, that you're, you're always on. Um, you know, it's just you can't, the news and, and certainly with the internet, it never sleeps. And so there is an expectation that there's always something there and that there's always something fresh. And nothing looks, nothing, nothing looks older than a site that purports to be offering commentary on daily events that doesn't have commentary on daily events. And you know, if you're missing something, it's it looks like a big, a big, huge, um, you know, a big bagel. It's it's a, it's a big. Well, empty one thing that works. Oh, okay. oh, I'm sorry. No, I was just going to say the other part of that is um, I I try to read as much as possible, as consistently as possible. So when I go uh, when I go to Emma with something, it's this hasn't already been done at three other places, and to make sure that you know there are definitely been times where I've thought of something and I realize you know this has been done three other places, and I'm not going to write it because I'm not adding something new to it. So being aware of the information that is out there is is enormously important to be able to react react to big events in a new and different way. And I think one thing we do well is, you know, somebody will jump in and be the first responder. Mm -hmm. And, like, I'll do that a lot, knowing that there's going to be people coming in from behind who the next day or the next day as the story evolves are actually going to take that. So I'll slide on to the next thing rather than being in this position where I'm grinding on, a, on the same story and hitting it 10, 11 times. And, and part of it is our charter that's not just the – while we got, want to get in quickly and, and, and efficiently, you know, cover the topic, not to just go in with the, the half-baked, half-thought-out yeah. thing, you know, take the extra – 90 minutes if that's what it takes to come up with something that's meaningful, has some insight, has some, has some meat to it, some value to it, and get that in there, and then kind of wait for the cavalry to come as the story keeps moving. Right. It also helps to hire people like Mike uh, and Emma and Howard who don't say, hey, I was thinking about writing about that, what do you think? They just do it and they send it in and next thing you know you have it. That, uh, that's a big part of it. We've got time for one more question, if there is one. If there is not one more question, guys, why don't you uh, why don't you hit everybody with your uh, Twitter handles? Uh, at Howard Magdal, H-O-W-A-R-D-M-E-G-D-A-L. Yeah, um, at 
Emma Spann, just right there. At William F. Leach, W I L I M F. It's, sorry, it's at Mike Tanier, and that's how it's spelled right there. And I look forward to uh, seeing all of you on the internet. Yeah. Great. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you.